Thanks, Jason, and uh, thanks for the introduction, and hello, everyone. Um, I, before beginning, I'll just pause, as others have, uh, and I'll acknowledge the lands from which I'm, I'm joining you. Uh, I'm in Salmon Arm on Shuswap Lake in the lands of the Sequebnik people. And I, I, I pause there because it leads me to reflect on the scope and, and the grounding of the issue that we're here um, to talk about today, conservation strategy for a special place and the connections that we all feel to that place, whether we live in that place or we simply appreciate its values. I've got a very unenviable slot here coming after a morning where we've heard about the very significant values um, not found elsewhere and the very significant threats in the heart of the Fraser area. And then some of the opportunities that Lena highlighted, and I'm going to be stepping in and giving you what looks like a dry talk from a regulatory perspective uh, from senior government. So you can appreciate why that might seem unenviable, but that's on purpose. This afternoon session number two is about the tools and strategies for habitat protection and uh, DFO being responsible for the Fisheries Act is uh, the steward of a number of the legislative tools that could be available and could assist in advancing a conservation strategy for the heart of the Fraser. But they're also part of the story of how we got here. So I hope today to give, a, it's not a technical session, but I'm stepping away from that very purposeful discussion this morning about values and threats to give you a sense of DFO's tools and strategies and how those might be applied to uh, the challenges we see in the heart of the Fraser uh, and some of the strengths of these approaches, but some of the challenges that we've seen in these with these approaches and some of the forward opportunities we might have for integrating DFO's tools with others to improve outcomes. Um, the arc of the talk is here on, on this overview slide. I'll, I'll cover some of the provisions, some of these common approaches um, that we apply. I did struggled with whether to call that common or historical, um, but uh, you'll see that as we proceed. And then I'll round that out with, I hope tying back to some of the points you heard this morning from Murray especially, but um, and and from Ian, but around how we are uh, also supportive and trying to advance a lot of these grassroots initiatives and not simply be a top-down agency. So to moving along. Um, the Fisheries Act is the basis of DFOs. It, 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 it's, it's the foundation of our legislative authorities. And the, the core business of the Fish and Fish Habitat uh, Protection Program, of which I'm part, is the administration and delivery of what's called the Fish and Fish Habitat Protection Provisions. A lot of the people, because of your interest in places like the Heart of the Fraser, probably have a high level familiarity with some of these provisions. They were recently amended in 2019 previously amended in 2012 and 2013. And so there's been a lot of public dialogue around what they do or can do uh, and should do. And the 2019 uh, amendments to the act, uh, just at a very high level cover off that, they restored that traditional protection around um, harm, full alteration, disruption or destruction of, of fish habitat and the death of fish, extended it from those supporting, uh, you know, uh, commercial recreational or Aboriginal fisheries to all efficient habitat in Canada. And it particularly returned those um, those prohibitions. Uh, and I'll speak more about prohibitions later and how they might be applied, but against death of fish and, and except by fishing and harm to habitat. Get, edging into the, I think, sort of the interest of what I think uh, an area of interest and worth of exploring for this group is when we start getting into things like the list of consideration factors that were also added to the amendment amended act. And I'll, I'll talk to those on the next slide. And towards the end of the talk, um, because really the core of DFO's business in habitat protection up until even 2012, 2019 was around these prohibitions. But uh, there were new authorities that were added in 2019 for which we're still working on regulatory frameworks and policy frameworks, but they give us some opportunities that we might look at going forward. And I, I know of particular interest to this group is the potential for um, the ecologically significant areas regulations. 
the changes to the act also in some places gave priority to restoration activities, which can apply again to places like Heart of the Fraser. And they included that posting of our decisions uh, on authorizations, which is a part of our work, uh, to a public registry to increase transparency. But the key bit before jumping into some, uh, what do we do and how do we do it um, and how might we do it differently is just a consideration of these factors. Now, these are something that was in the, the 2012 Act, carried forward and was expanded under the 2019 Act. And these are things that when DFO is going to take a decision on a habitat matter, um, death of fish, harm to habitat, flows, for example, or past regulations related to those, we have to consider these factors. I won't read them through individually. But I'm going to note here just for people to think about that one way to influence the decisions and shape the outcomes of the administration of the Fisheries Act is to inform on these points. The more we understand the values and the sensitivities, the objectives and the strategies uh, and the measurable outcomes that we would pursue in order to improve salmon outcomes or improve fish, improve fish and habitat outcomes, uh, the more, the better we define it, the more that we can assess our decisions against those. Um, oftentimes, our, our consideration of these factors is at the highest level, as that is how things like fisheries management objectives are written. But they can be more granular. Uh, just quickly, the way I personally think of when I did my regulatory biologist job, the, the Fisheries Act was just as this stoplight diagram that I'll quickly note them in the next couple of slides, but they're in their application. But generally speaking, the Fisheries Act, except for these new opportunities that I'll speak about later, is really about the prohibitions, things you shouldn't do, like obstruct passage of fish, kill, kill fish except by fishing, harm habitat, deposit de or pollute, deposit deleterious substances. And there's some duties providing plans and specifications, notifying the department if you're going to cause death of fish, taking corrective measures to mitigate or reverse the impacts, and then report these outcomes. And one might imagine if we were all had perfect knowledge of the prohibitions and of the duties and of the world around us, the fish and the habitats within it, that we wouldn't get to the damage and that causes impacts to our populations and challenges our fisheries and our ecosystems. But in the course of our business, we do see those, and some of them are by necessity, some of them are acceptable. Things like public infrastructure come to mind, but um, that raises the exceptions in the Act, which were expanded in 2019, but at their core are that it's okay, it's illegal, it's legal to, uh, to um, cross with the prohibitions um, as long as you are doing so, for example, under an authorization, which comes with conditions, financial securities, and offsets. But I'll, I'll speak to that in the next couple of slides while I watch the clock counting down. Um, there are two ways that DFO typically has applied these core authorities in the Fisheries Act, and one of them is proactive, generally speaking, and the other one is reactive, generally speaking. Proactive is the area of reviewing projects that are brought to the department. We are asked for advice. And we have whole policy frameworks um, and, re and regulatory frameworks to explain how we administer these authorities. And they're decisions that, for the most part, are taken one at a time with the information presented and the best available information uh, as context. And they consider things like, what are the fish species present, the fish habitat? What is the sensitivity? Are there species at risk or aquatic invasive species? And can harm to those things, those values, be avoided or mitigated? And we have tools that are available and they're linked there. I believe you're getting going to get copies of this deck, but um, where like pathways of effects where we can assess what the outcomes are like and whether there's going to be a residual harm that would need to, despite our best efforts to avoid, despite our best efforts to mitigate, something harmful could happen. And that's when we go and undertake regulatory reviews. But you can imagine that a lot of work that's happening out there on the land when individually assessed by the most diligent biologist in context of the information that is there um, and considered even in a, a, a broad context might be acceptable under policy and regulatory frameworks. But when you zoom back to the 10,000 foot level that we saw shared by speakers this morning, you realize it's above the level of the project. I'll probably, I'll get to that, I hope, towards the end of the, that we're seeing the consequences on our populations. 
But at the project level, we, we can review and do review projects where we again assess risk in detail, looking at specific habitat components, things like residual pressures, again applying avoidance and mitigation before we get to considering whether there would be a harm or whether it's allowable. And when we have to make those decisions based again on frameworks for evaluating and treating risk and deciding whether a legal instrument's needed, if it's justified to harm habitat, in which case that would be an authority where we undertake consultation formally with Indigenous peoples and ultimately could respond by not authorizing a harm um, or authorizing it. But if we do so, it's with specific conditions. It's not simply to allow harm, but with specific conditions and financial securities and what we call offsetting, which is finding ways to create habitat to offset habitat loss and monitoring. But one, again, would wonder if we're have all these authorities in place and we're considering projects one at a time, what are, how do we find ourselves in the current situation of declining salmon populations and harm to habitat? And I'd offer that there's a broad suite of land use and water use activities that are influencing salmon habitat and salmon outcomes that are well above the level of projects that traditionally would have come to the department for review. And that starts to highlight the need for all of us to work collectively and collaboratively in the same direction uh, towards applying these authorities both individually and broadly so we can improve outcomes. This is probably even more important and more highlighted by the uh, appliance, uh, apply, uh, application of Fisheries Act authorities to uh, occurrences or, or reports of impacts to habitat. I won't go through in the level of detail of the last slide. I have about seven minutes left and a lot of material to cover. But essentially, there's a very structured process as well for con conducting uh, for DFO's occurrence response activities, in inspections and investigations led by officers. There's inspectors, there's uh, biologists, the subject matter experts that offer input to that. And then those are rolled up. There's, there's opportunity as that information comes and we understand the scope of impacts for a fishery officer or an inspector to require corrective measures. And it's important to note there are no violation tickets for habitat provisions of the Fisheries Act, and there's no often reporting of activities such as occurrence response inspections um, and, or the issuance of corrective measures or compliance with corrective measures, but a great deal of activity is happening out in the field on these types of issues that are resulting in engagement and decision and outcomes for fish and habitat. And they're not always those that would satisfy uh, many, you know, many of folks on this call that would want to see the best possible outcomes and most precautious approach for fish and habitat. But it, it, they're also often not satisfactory to perhaps others that are concerned about overreach or concerned about uh, consistency of decisions. And it's that line that we've come to be understand as this impartial public service that tries to make reasonable decisions, um, that we find that thread and that we ensure that there's an equitable application of these protections. We're not blind to the fact that there's different outcomes, but reasonableness, and that's what this compliance continuum on the right is about. So one thing I've heard from a lot of our training in-house and, and when I was consulting was that people expect outcomes to be consistent and reasonable. And that's why often, again, with things like um, engagement, education, uh, corrective measures, warnings, we, ex uh, we have a compliance continuum where we try to educate people and help them to understand what their obligations and responsibilities are uh, under the Act, ours and others, and facilitate compliance before we start moving to things like active enforcement. And ultimately, if we must, I think we're down the road of it not being a win already, but it does not, that does not mean our resolve should be shaken. It still will be a long-term process. So when a system is working for DFO and, incur, uh, and enforcement around habitat, um, it may be slow, slower than we and others would like, but it's about being uh, purposeful and responsive and, uh, and reasonable in those cir circumstances. And uh, I will leave it at that. But uh, these past tools of the act, the, the, the tools we've used to date, they're all very important and they have a place going forward. I think there was a recognition though over the years that those authorities in and of themselves and those individual project reviews, I think about the talk that Ryan gave this morning about um, sediment budgets. 
and uh, and hydrology and how from the headwaters down to the down to the sand heads the fraser river is a dynamic system and places like the gravel reach are the sum total of the contributions upstream and the contributions downstream and he zoomed out in his photo and he showed us things like the uh the 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 lower reach and the gravel reach, the tidal reach and the gravel reach, the Fraser River. And it came apparent to me that all those things probably happen one project review at a time. And if it, and that was project reviews by all levels, whether it's municipal, port authorities, federal government. But I think that was part of the lessons that went into the revisions of the Act in 2019, when we saw that there was a larger context that could be applied to the business of the Department and Habitat Protection. And so you saw regulation making authorities come in, like the prescribed works and waters, death of fish. I won't read the list uh, in the middle slide there. There were also standards and codes of practice where we could provide some re regulatory clarity. But and then there's a, a, an engagement action that or activity that we're trying to make part of our core business, where we go out and we share the information as it's being developed before it goes to things like consultation tables or to public engage or to to regulation making. Um, so it's a different way of doing business. But um, these authorities expand the department's ability to be proactive in setting desired future states for fish and habitat. And one of the most interesting or most interest, I think, to many of the people in this group would be the ecologically significant areas in the middle of the middle column. What's important to recognize in most contexts when we're, we're, we are uh, the ecologically significant areas are raised uh, with our program, it's in the context of increasing protection. And that is part of the concept for ecologically significant areas. It's a tool based in regulation for specific habitats that are sensitive, highly productive, rare, or unique. These came from the Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans report and the government's response, and ultimately were enshrined in the regulation. They can, they're, a they're an area-based management tool, and they're the only tool the department has for area-based management in the freshwater and, and uh, environment and in intertidal areas, because marine protected areas apply outside of that. Um, but it's, it's very important to understand the structure of the ESAs, and they're a regulation that would, they would be a ministerial regulation established by governing or in council, and they would have specific conservation and protection objectives. The kind of a objectives that we have yet to see articulated for places like the heart of the Fraser. The kind of objectives that if they existed would inform the current occurrence response and project reviews of DFO and other bodies. But once we had those conservation and protection objectives, they would also be based in regulation. And there'd be three categories of projects broadly that could be included or not included. And those would be ones that DFO would be prepared to authorize because they're consistent with the conservation objectives. Those that DFO would not authorize because they're not consistent with the conservation objectives. And those which would be subject to, uh, those on which the regulations are silent and the way which would follow the standard project review process that exists today. So the real, I think, change with ecologically significant areas is the opportunity for us to define what our values are in terms of sensitive, highly productive, rare, and unique, and what our objectives and strategies are by which we deliver it. And there would be necessary assessments of things like um, the ecological and, and cultural and socioeconomic aspects. These are things that all regulations have to go through with government. There'd be assessments of how it matched with other authorities or like wildlife management areas. That happens with all regulations going forward in, in government. But whether the right, they're the right tool is going to come down to these conservation objectives. And I'm nearing out of time, folks, so I'll have to rush a bit. But I wanted to note that ecologically significant areas is available on what we have the talkfishhabitat.ca website um, currently. That's the Fish and Fish Habitat Pro Programs Engagement Platform. That lays out a lot more information than I can provide today about ecologically significant areas. And it's open this spring until May for people to review contents like a fact sheet, like a technical deck, Q&As, and to provide feedback. And so I'd encourage people who are interested to look there. But as a sneak peek, just be mindful that the next two slides I'll go quickly. Um, but 
that each ESA is expected to go through what's likely three phases, where we identify candidates, where we, uh, where we define things like the threats, the, um, the feasibility of ESAs relative to other tools or that it may be available, the objectives and priorities, where we evaluate things like consistency of certain works relative to those uh, conservation objectives, whether they're consistent, so that we can arrive at these lists of authorizable, not authorizable, and, and, and regular project review process. Then there's the consultation and regulatory process associated with establishing ESAs, determining whether restoration is necessary and restoration plans are, are required to be included. And then there will be implement, and that would include, as I said, consultation with all levels of government and Indigenous peoples. And then there'd be ESA management, which again would have collaborative opportunities. But all of this starts with identifying special places and their values and the threats. It is a powerful tool potentially where we can capture those in regulation. But at the end of the day, its success is going to be around how well we define those conservation objectives. And they won't happen soon. There will probably be months to years before we are able to get to an ESA, but the groundwork can be started today, whether we go to an ESA outcome, a wildlife management area, an indigenous protected area, or simply an improvement of our day-to-day -day work in project reviews and occurrence response by identifying values and threats and setting objectives that are broadly supported and acknowledged. I'm gonna close with just a couple of slides as examples, just so I said I'd, highlight, I'd loop back to where Murray had started. And Murray highlighted the two in the two inverted triangles about how governments top down and senior top down and the indigenous communities and I've heard the same in some ways from local from local governments are bottom up <clears throat> but I'd like to highlight some of these DFO supported activities as ways that we're directing our support and resources towards priorities that are identified by others outside the department within bounds of things like the terms of a funding program I think we could all do better about connecting these activities to specific priorities, place-based priorities. And I think that's, again, an opportunity for setting things like conservation objectives. Well, so these works, while vital and important, and in many cases, refuge areas in the face of flooding uh, against, uh, uh, against losses that would have happened in the main channel, um, these are restoration projects for previously damaged habitat of the kind that Lena talked about. So whether that was the Tom Berry project through the Coastal Restoration Fund or our, SEPS, our Salmon Oil Enhancement Program staff working with bands like the Seabird Island Band and, and, come, and providing technical expertise to, to regrade and maintain spawning gravel areas, or some of the planning activities we've supported through BC Thrift, like the Lower Fraser Fisheries Alliance's uh, restoration framework that they described this morning, or uh, the Watershed Watch and Tides Canada partners, um, Makeway Foundation, um, their regional flood infrastructure assessments. These are ways that the department is trying to align our resources with some of these broader priorities. So I'll close here. I won't read through the slide. I guess I would just end with saying, I'm, I'm going to let my inside voice out a little bit, uh, something I, don't, uh, I try not to do. But, um, Two things. When Ryan zoomed out and showed us this morning that the Fraser River begins in its headwaters and goes to the sandbanks, and and when we saw the map of the lower Fraser that Lena showed, it brought to my mind something that someone else said. It's not my term. That we are all salmon habitat managers, from the mountaintops to the ocean, we make decisions. We do our best within policy frameworks, the information in front of us to make the right decisions project by project. But the outcomes that are being experienced by salmon and their habitats and other fish species in their habitats are the culmination of all those decisions. And they involve people making decisions across levels of government and communities and regulatory authorities. And I'd suggest to the, this group that if we began to collectively identify values that were multi accepted by multi-stakeholder groups and tied to specific place-based objectives, we would have a touchstone for whether we were doing our daily assessments and whether we were, or whether we were doing our funding programs or whether we were deciding where we would apply, deploy our regulatory tools. And I just 
feel that that is a real organization uh, or a, a good starting point for a, gr a group like this um, and perhaps something we can organize ourselves around because it does position us at the end of the day as all being salmon habitat managers able to guide our daily decisions in business with a lens of conservation objectives i'll stop there that was a bit preachy towards the end happy to take any questions Thank you so much, Bruce. And uh, yeah, I really love the, we are all salmon habitat managers at the end there. I think that's a great, a great perspective to take. And at Rivershed, we like to say we all live in a watershed. Uh, and I think that most sort of all event everywhere is a watershed or, or salmon habitats. And we do have a few minutes here for some questions. And I have one in the Slido, but if anyone else uh, does have any questions, please add them to the Slido. And if you if we don't get them to write to them right now, we'll try to get to them later. Uh, so for, for Bruce, you mentioned cumulative effects are a consideration, but what weight is given to this measure? And at what point does DFO say cumulative effects are too great and there should be no more at a watershed scale? That's a huge question. It's hard to give a really concise response to it. And there's sort of the notional response, and then there's the really legalese response, and they're different responses. So I guess what I would speak to is when DFO makes a regulatory decision um, because of those factors that I listed out, one of those factors is cumulative effects. And there's some context. If you look at the Talk Fish Habitat website, uh, it came out in wave one, the cumulative effects guidance the department has been working on to talk about exactly what you're asking. At what point? What do we consider? when we talk about cumulative effects and at what point is enough is 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 enough too much and so i don't have a sharp answer for you i can say a few things though formal cumulative effects assessment under those factors of the act are um, tied to reg making of regulations or taking a regulatory decision like issuing an authorization so they're generally around when you cannot avoid an impact and you cannot mitigate an impact and you're looking at a specific impact on a habitat component. What's it gonna do to fish and habitat? And what could you do to mitigate it? Um, like limit encroachment in the channel. What could you do to offset it? Um, or can you expand the channel elsewhere? Do you result, do you result in a, a no net loss at a site level or, in, or net gain with offsetting? And if you can, then essentially project by project, the finding would be, that you're addressing cumulative effects. I think where you see different outcomes of the kind you're talking about is where you have things like regional cumulative effects assessments that identify, and this is sort of the work that we're supporting under the Salish Sea Initiative, for example, to identify thresholds where beyond which we could conclude through an impact assessment, there'd be significant adverse effects. But in most cases, because of things like in the habitat program, when we're working at, on individual project by project reviews, these impacts, and, and their effects are, so, are quite localized and the decisions are taken in that context. I see a different future where we can be more proactive and address, I think, outside of that regulatory context. I probably called it notional to start with and I didn't mean, that's not the right word. For example, we know if we had a better sense of what the values and the threats to a fish population in a watershed are, um, and we know, for example, under the, uh, say the decisions that, or the projects that the department does review on an annual basis and may respond with advice because impacts can be avoided or may authorize. We can track the types of land use and the types of impacts. And other jurisdictions do this kind of thing like BC. If we were to look at those distributed across watersheds and consider the types of habitats that are being affected positively or negatively, um, by types of activities, I think we could add that to the priorities list of types of works we wish to fund uh, or offset with things like restoration funding that we could collectively work towards and thus, I think, meaningfully address collectively cumulative effects assessment above the level of project by project. But for your to sharpen your question, regional assessments support conclusions of the kind you are looking for and they would happen under uh, a major project and and it would be um, uh, under the impact assessment act so uh, with dfo what happens more often is someone brings forward an idea we work with them they end up abandoning their idea because the 
the technical design challenges and mitigation costs would be too great for it, order for it to proceed. So you're unlikely to find yourself go through a review to the point where someone says, okay, you tell me it can't be done and we'll drop it. Sorry if that was a long answer. I tend to go for the weeds. <laughs>